Okay, it's, it's a great example. And it shows how various media can be paced and cut and graded to capture the vibe of the intended project. It's super well edited. But unfortunately, it never got greenlit. Um, I think it was pub posted publicly in order to gain traction for it. But that's a shame, because it would have been a really cool and arresting addition to the current swathe of superhero films. In fact, if it was a game, I'd probably love to play it. Okay, before moving on from pre-production and style guides, I want to tackle vertical slices. Some of you may know what they are. A vertical slice is a proof of concept of the finished quality game. It's usually a whole or partial level made to look and play as the finished article. It's traditionally used as a production quality <coughs> gate to pass before production proper is greenlit. I say made to look and play as it usually involves a lot of smoke and mirrors. As the issue is you need to, the technology that will be developed in production to create the very thing that will be greenlit in the production in the first place, it's a chicken and egg situation. But it can be more of a problem than that. In addition, the, the art team will be caught up in creating content at the same time as those needing the content working, which means the visual development isn't evolving and the design is waiting for content to work with. To use an architect analogy, a vertical slice of a game, a complete game, is like the client asking the architect he wants to design and build a skyscraper. But they need some confidence that you can complete the job before they'll give you the money. So they'd like you to build a floor so they can walk around it and see what it is they want. But they'll need a higher floor to really tell, so why don't you build us the 60th floor and we'll check it out, we'll sure it'll be great. Of course, it's impossible to just build that floor. You have to build the whole skyscraper up to the 60th floor in order to build the actual floor so the client can see it. Vertical slices are kind of like that. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors, but it's a significant part of the technology and content that has to be built to complete the slice. And the problem is that the other disciplines are all working on this slice concurrently. So what do you do? Is there a better way? Well, it's almost a talk in itself, but for a start, I'll push, I would push for a separation of disciplines. Split your demonstrations for proving gameplay and the viability of the project and providing the art direction. Gameplay should get more iteration cycles and less waiting on content if they work on a simple prototype. And art should build a slice purely to capture the look, feel, and tone of the game. Keep the dialogue open between both disciplines but you should not need to prototype and early iterate gameplay with finished content. You'll just burn your pre-production time. Of course, it's scalable and similar lessons can be applied to smaller games too. Okay, moving on from the start pre-production. Simplifying your vision. This is more about communication to your team and keeping it understandable for your team and players. Use key images and phrases are one way but also the use of symbolism and metaphor, both in-game and within your teamwork, can help immensely. Using a visual metaphor or symbol internally can help simplify comprehension of complex tasks and vision for the team. With world building, we often need to create something that captures the spirit of a place. How do we distill down and communicate its essence to the viewer effectively and efficiently without extraneous visual information or detail. Cities and urban environments in particular have a lot of visual noise. Is there any thought processes that help filter and encapsulate the feel of that place? The first steps in a real world inspired project are usually with reference gathering. Once a location has been decided and a candidate real world location has been found and possibly scouted, you will have a dump of photographs and videos to use. Um, for instance, on a, on a GTA, we, we could have above 200,000 photographs. I mean, it's a lot of work and months of, of sorting and, and sifting through that material. Taking that spread of reference and details and distilling them down is a crucial step. Trying to capture the essence of a real world place as a game world isn't easy. A visual metaphor can be employed within your team to help with the world building. 
A trick I've used for crafting a world referenced in the real world is to think of your world interpreted as a souvenir snow globe. It's basically a metaphor for thinking and seeing like a tourist. Similar to a tourist visiting a new place for the first time, think of your players as initially foreign to your game's environments. This foreign perspective of a place can help shape the bigger brush strokes that define a place without the over-familiarity of the native inhabitant, which in this case would be the creating artist or level designer. If you imagine the player as a tourist to your world, what would be the distilled version of the snow globe? What is important to them visually? And how does scale and relative positioning relate? If it's based on a real place, maybe most people haven't experienced it in real life, but virtually through media. How does this place's place representation in film differ? Pop culture will always affect people's expectations and preconceptions and has to be taken into consideration. Although hopefully they don't expect to see a Stark Tower in your version of New York. Another example, which is using a key term, is in the work in pre-production for Quantum Break. As I'm no longer attached to the project and the game doesn't launch till April, Remedy kindly agreed to let me discuss a couple of things which when I was involved with the visual design process and pre-production. The team are still hard at work finishing it off, but it's looking awesome and it's going to be another Remedy classic. Uh, this, this particular piece relates to the visual design for the enemy organisation for the game, Monarch Solutions. The visual style needed to be Visual style needed to reflect the spirit of the company that seeks superiority through advanced science and research. Rather than look towards other games, I wanted to capture the flavor of real science. We researched the heavy science imagery from places such as CERN and NASA, and we even visited AltaZone labs for visual references too. Finally, to communicate the essence of the style, we coined the term militarized NASA to try to put the imagery of weaponized experimental technology in the minds of the team. The in-game look for them ended up a mix of robust but delicate elements that hopefully the player feels gives them more of an ownable look and less typical military of, of a lot of games. There's another story which I love, might not be all true, but it's a great story for about capturing high-level art direction with a single image, which was a story Ken Levine told about the shift in art direction for Bioshock Infinite. The concepts for the world early on were heading in a much darker, smokier Art Nouveau direction. And one morning, apparently, he was out for a jog and saw this shiny metal mailbox reflecting the color of the blue sky. He took a photograph of that on his phone and went into the team and showed this as his inspiration for what became a bold and unique visual design for the world of Colombia. Like I said, okay, it's probably an exaggeration, but it is a great tale and really sums up how a single image, a statement, or a metaphor, or a symbol can help really drive the team forward. The next thing is casting the net wide. This basically means looking for reference in a wide range of locations. There's a problem in our industry currently of recycling imagery and designs. It's like the snake eating its own tail. It's been highlighted for over many years from several people, but it's easy to fix by widening our horizons. By employing good artistic rigor and sourcing inspiration and reference, you increase your chances of creating something memorable and unique compared to other games. For the start of Alan Wake, American Nightmare, the game was supposed to start with the house from the previous Alan Wake rising out of the water pool in a cavern. We tried to make the cavern work, but it lacked somehow drama and it felt claustrophobic. Also, it was nighttime and our main lighting source was the moon, so a cavern wasn't really going to give as much light in order to light this scene. Um, so I had to think about places I visited, and I decided to pitch a sinkhole, which needed a rock formation that would act as a screen and a dramatic form for the opening's vista. 
and I remember visiting the Vasquez Rocks near LA. These are sheets of rock which rise into the air and have a really dynamic quality to them. And also because of its proximity to LA, it's also in pop culture as a famous filming location. In fact, it's probably most notable for an original episode of Star Trek where Captain Kirk fights a man in a terrible green rubber suit. So I created a rough concept of the location. This is the original concept painting. And the, the environment artist took this and translated it into the, the starting location. He did a great job. Um, he managed to retain the aggressive otherworldly silhouettes of the concept, while at the same time making it work for screening the opening that takes you through to the rest of the level. So again, we looked further afield to find the references. Moving on to Play Raven and one of our new games, soon to be in global launch, Winter State. I think it's actually in soft launch in Finland right now. We needed a figurehead for the frozen land of Winter State. It's a post-ecological apocalypse vehicle combat game set in the frozen eastern US with a colorful collection of places, characters, and has a frontier vibe. As a player, you lead a vehicle convoy fighting and trading to get the remnants of society and the emerging new state back on its feet. Building up a fleet of archetypal vehicles and hiring a collection of drivers from around the game world. I describe it as Mad Max meets the day after tomorrow with a bit of the frontier west thrown in for good measure. You could think of the player as a western wagon train boss, but with modern vehicles armed to the teeth. And the world needs these players. And also to help tie the pockets of remaining civilization together against the chaos of bandits and gangs. So it made me think of propaganda posters as reference. So soon I hit upon the idea of abstracting Uncle Sam. He has this rallying, fighting spirit persona. So I drew a new concept of him. I created a new flag for the winter state and I abstracted him with uh, mixes of, mixed with the shades of the Lincoln Memorial, where Lincoln sits on this throne seat. It subverted into a more post-apocalyptic regal position and it represents the figurehead for the game world. The image drove us not only to create key art, but also helps with merchandising for pins, postal designs and stickers. We've also used the app icon on uh, as his face, which is something different from the, the, what you normally see in the app store. Obviously, it's mobile games, so we need to do some metrics-driven tests, but hopefully it will still stay. Another example of using a fairly rigorous reference research process was during, again, during work, pre-production work for Quantum Break. One of the biggest visual look challenges in the game we had was the question, what does time look like? I mean, you can't actually see time, but only its effects. But since we're, we're creating a game about time manipulation, we had to invent a visual and physical presence for time in the game. We needed to create something tangible to show that time is clearly breaking and fracturing and behaving abnormally at certain points in the game. So I took a look across sculpture, painting, photography and video art. We pulled a set of visual elements that would, that would form the ingredients for our version of time in the game. The main element that evolved from this was prismatic fracturing of the, of the image and a color grading treatment to give a bleached world feel. Later, the technical art director, who is now art director on the rest of the project, devised flakes and audio-driven distortion effects to further add movement to the world. These really brought it all together into one compelling ecosystem for stutters. Stutters are the moments of broken time in the game where the world freezes and skips and repeats. The rendering team and art direction came together to create what I believe is a standout visual element in the world. It's a great example of a collaboration between art and technology. And it was a, it was a long process and it, there was a lot of discussion, but I think we've got something there that's going to be memorable. 
The last thing is visual stereotypes. Now, there is a tendency, as I said, for overuse of visual design tropes within our industry, which, of course, we should challenge. But there is a danger of us decrying and demonising all use of commonly employed visuals as worthless cliché. And this really isn't the case. In our quest to craft new work and strong visual identity and a uniquely identifiable vibe of its own, we need to be aware of the useful tool we have in employing common visual elements within our projects. Especially for those projects in AAA where we hope to reach out and appeal to a large audience. They can be a useful element in distilling down real world locations or supporting creating new visual elements. Or ownable looks with a strong visual touch point for the audience. Cliché is the most negative association of all. And trope is often used as a cinnamon for cliché. Like the bad guy wears black. Cliché is an expression, idea or element of an artistic work which has become overused to the point of losing its original meaning or effect. You can describe it as a visual element that has taken on a life of its own and no longer has the originally intended purpose for the viewer. It would likely be a distraction from the storytelling or weaken the player's immersion. But stereotype is a container for preconceptions. It's different. Visual stereotypes is a term I would prefer to use which are a useful to tool if used carefully and in the right balance of your, with your more original content. It can speak to the audience in ways that we can help to support storytelling or expedite immersion into the world. They help open the door to your worlds or characters and they lay a visual threshold for the audience to cross. Preconception can be leveraged positively with the use of common or pop cultural visual elements so that's why I'm attempting to draw a line between these useful elements and cliché by using the term visual stereotype. Admittedly, it's a very subjective boundary between cliché and visual stereotype. And we have to rely on our internal compass here as artists to see what is supportive or not. However, a simple test to ask yourself is, does this design support and contribute to the visual rules of the world it exists in? It's a question I'll be raising again later in the talk as a check on other elements. Often when under pressure to create new elements in your game world, there is a temptation to simply rely on tried and tested industry tropes. Although that said, some cliches are now convention and really shouldn't be messed with. In games, we have a complex world to communicate and the use of visual stereotype can communicate the foundations of setting and help free up the audience's time to focus on new design elements. If you think of the attention span and time the audience has as a limited amount of water and you have so many buckets to fill, setting player motivations, character introductions, game design mechanics are a few of those. Maybe you can't fill all those buckets and you end up with the player failing to be fully immersed in your game world or fails to find the story compelling enough or fails to grasp the new gameplay mechanics you're attempting to introduce. Use of visual stereotypes can help fill some of those buckets by allowing them to be partially filled by some preconceptions and anticipation the player brings with them. It allows you to spend resources you have to invest in the introduction and exposition better on your more unique and compelling design features. It will mark, help mark your game out from the rest. With that extra time, we can avoid resorting to excessive or naive methods of exposition and world rule communication, like those used for audiences seen in B-movies, where the main character asks for a complete explanation of a plot device, which he clearly should know about, as he is a character in the world and should be more aware of the situation. It's a similar to the classic show-don't-tell rule of level design. Try to find the resources to present the game world in a less direct way and leave the player more satisf satisfied and intrigued for more. So movies often employ visual stereotype as convention to support exposition and settle the audience into a theme or genre. Often refer referred to cliche, but that, I think that usually has a, such a negative connotation it's doing a disservice. I feel this often, uh, that 
helps, this often helps a movie which has a limited time with its audience to communicate more effectively and efficiently. As a classic example of film employing visual stereotypes, the Western genre of films has become synonymous with the landscape of Monument Valley. Popularized by John Ford and classics like The Searchers, over 50 Western themed films have been filmed in and around this location to the point it's ingrained in popular culture as a symbol of the Wild West. It's been used in classic visual stereotype in more modern films too, attempting to immediately grasp the Western theme. And of course, it would make a perfect sense to introduce in a Western themed game world too. Another example, you wouldn't expect this to be a setting for a romantic comedy. The Cabin in the Woods is a classic horror visual stereotype, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. As the preconceptions it carries with it builds audience anticipation, and anticipation is part of the emotional currency the genre uses to trade for scares. 2015's Max Fury Road, which clearly had a much deeper world and culture than was explained to the audience. We were left to work out the details for ourselves, but never really felt overly disorientated or confused by the setting. Part of that, I believe, is down to some of the familiar imagery presented, such as the culture and worship of the cars in the world. As twisted and adrenaline fueled as they were, they struck a familiar note to the viewer. It's a dystopian future, but where are the modern cars of the world that this has just collapsed? The classic car customization imagery is familiar to the audience. It's a piece of pop culture and so would resonate better with them to form something more compelling and interesting visually. The imagery is then taken to extremes with cars welded onto cars and uh, given a more adrenaline fueled um, dent. So moving on to games. At the extreme end of this pacing, the need for rapid visual comprehension and exposition is in mobile, especially free to play titles. Any investment in the visual introduction to your world, it, you have more than, no more than a few seconds. It can result in players losing interest and potentially abandoning the game altogether if you take that too far. Which brings me back to Winter State. To create the world of Winter State, we brought in a writer and together we created a new society and cultures <coughs> that had grown since the events that froze the world. However, we had a problem communicating any of this and establishing the, the setting needs to be so rapid, and as this isn't your typical free-to-play mobile game, we knew we would have to rely on use of already established imagery from elsewhere in order to quickly get a message to the player. Looking to movie tradition, it made sense to echo Hollywood's long-standing tradition with destroying the Statue of Liberty. The statue has been a commonly used visual icon for years in Hollywood, and it has represented the collapse of civilization and the US in particular in an apocalyptic event. From famously the Planet of the Apes final scene to a flying Liberty's head scraping to a halt in a street in Cloverfield, it's been a powerful statement of disaster and something a broad audience would likely have seen and recognize its use and associations and location. So giving us place an event and a single recognizable image gave us some storytelling shorthand for a limited attention span audience, which we used initially in early key art and finally into the art of the game proper. It's an example of efficient use of film trope when time on a project is critically short for exposition. So remember the Monarch brand in Quantum Break I discussed earlier? Well, there's another very subtle example of visual stereotype at play there. We were inspired by the 1974 NASA brand guidelines manual, among other influences. With this reference, the palette of the company was aimed at using their version of the classic <coughs> color schemes of orange, black, gray, and white. It's a color theme you can see, not only from old NASA, but also repeated in science fiction film history from 2001 onwards. We believed we could create something with, still create something with a unique presence that would feel more real but also use a palette that would lay a foundation in the player's mind of a corporation with its strengths in science and research and science fiction in general. For the second part of the talk, I decided to take a step away from the world building and look at a common visual element in many games. 
and use it to highlight some of the ways we can improve the art and design process to create elements that support and enrich the worlds we create and attempt to avoid falling into the use of visual cliche. It's the flip side of the previous part about visual stereotypes. As with all large art, as, as with all art, a large part of it is subjective and I'll be critiquing other games to highlight some of my thoughts. Uh, you might disagree, we can talk about that later. Okay, the heavy. We all know the heavy archetype. It's a classic gameplay archetype and used to add gameplay variety <coughs> and add intensity to the player's experience. I guess you could classify him as a subtitle of the, of the boss or mini boss, typically harder to kill with higher health or armor and more deadly firepower. So that's the typical game design, but what about the visual form? Well, the 1987 movie Predator has a lot to answer for. It's left us with a visual legacy of almost 30 years for one of the standard archetypes of game design. Don't get me wrong, I love Predator, and Jesse Ventura's Blaine is a memorable character. So much so, we named the county in GTA V after him. <laughs> But the characters' looks have gone on to burden us with years of repeating 80s action hero visuals and games. You can see many of the features of this visual trope employed in part or whole when it comes to the use of gameplay archetype in games. So much so, it's taken on a life of its own and become a visual cliche, often employed with little relation to the looks of the game it lives in. A character is an important element in a building and storytelling of a world, you have so much broader range of expressing your designs with interaction and animation that, that, than the static environment of a game world can lend. So therefore, it's an opportunity you shouldn't waste when trying to tell the visual story of the world. You have to be aware of the pitfalls and empty calories of using visual cliche. It's like star vehicle films, where often the actor's name is larger than the actual movie title on the poster. The character the actor is playing is overshadowed by the star actor's own persona. The character becomes throwaway, and the star feels somehow a separate element to the world they are performing in. In a game, the use of such imagery breaks the fourth wall in a way. You have this character reminding, of you, reminding you you're playing a game. Of course, there are situations where the use of visual cliché is part of the art direction, using the preconceptions of the viewer to the game's advantage. The obvious example being Team Fortress 2, where the visual stereotype is a functional expression of the character <coughs> class within the game. So when designing the character, or indeed any element in your game world, remember the check, does this support and strengthen the visual design of the world? If you have any doubts, then reassess if you have the best design possible within the restrictions of functionality, technical requirements and production time you have remaining. Let's look at some examples. Recent titles are still employing this visual trope. Infamous Second Son has some fantastic visuals, particularly the FX design and world design. But the heavy character design trope is there too, particularly in the introduction to the class. I could prefer the smaller guys. They are really stepping up their game. Definitely prefer the smaller guys. Now, it's a heavily gameplay-driven title in an open world with something of a comic book vibe. So you can understand the designs may employ these cliches to help gameplay readability in combat. But it's still there. You still have this repeated imagery from the last 30 years. But to me, the character design here sits at odds with the quality of visual design and art direction and a lot of the rest of the title. It pushes the gaminess of the enemy design too far, and you feel the visual design rules for the world should have suggested something that added more to the game as a whole. Of course, the visual design containing elements of the visual cliche and not sitting entirely in the world's visual design rules <laughs> is one way visual design can cause issues, but it's not the only way. What if the class is introduced to a game focusing strongly on storytelling and immersion? 
looking at one of the best console experiences of recent times, The Last of Us, again with a beautifully created world mythology, characters and storyline. Hopefully most of you have played this as it's one of the finest games of the last generation. And I don't want to be giving away too much here if you haven't. The main enemy types that are created by the cordyceps fungal spores have a clear life cycle. The form of the invading fungus becoming more visible in the body. The stage of changes in the infected level are reflected in a very real and convincing series of visual and gameplay developments expressing the increase in threat and visible and unsettling loss of humanity in the victim. The penultimate stage of infection was the clicker, a blind sound detecting creature with ruined skull that's hard to take down and can kill on failing a one hit death minigame. It feels like the ultimate level of the infection, the loss of the face and eyes creating a disturbing but familiar monster. But there's one more stage rarely seen in the game. We see the introduction of the heavy archetype at a later point in the game, apparently the final infection stage, the bloater. But somehow it feels to me out of place in this imagined life cycle and a repeat of a lot of the visuals and traits of the, of the the last stage, the clicker, particularly the destroyed head and sound sensitive gameplay, but with some of the classic heavy, heavy silhouette and size added. To me personally, it felt like it had been a later expansion of the game's combat repertoire, that the world's elegant mythology didn't truly support and had the feeling of having been retrofitted into the infected life cycle. It felt gamey and detrimental to the immersion of this beautifully crafted world and atmosphere. However, when I looked further into the backstory to the class, I actually discovered it was the first class they experimented with before splitting the infected into further classes. Now, I'm not saying it ruined the game for me, but it's one of the, it's one of the finest console experiences, as I said. But I just wonder if the game is better or worse for its addition. It's an interesting problem of how do you handle the addition of classes or archetypes that possibly break or challenge the visual design model of your world especially potentially late in production. Should it have been dropped to keep the elegance of the world design? There's always that risk of diluting player immersion if they remain. But that's an extreme step, and it would depend on the title's aspirations. So the step that needs, that step like that needs discussion and appraisal. Of course, a better solution is, since the game development is such a complex, fluid, and collaborative process, should you not strive to create a robust design rule set and a mythology for your world that supports change and expansion? Because generally, I've found with game development, it pays off to plan for change to some extent. It does seem an inevitability. So if when building a world with a compelling and appealing visual design rule set, what are the good examples? What happens, what, what examples of the heavy archetype do I think have artistic success? And past the does this support and strengthen the visual design of the world test? Well, an obvious example was Bioshock, a game series that created very unique and interesting worlds for the player. I'm sure most of you have probably played these games, but the Art Deco styled underwater city of Rapture has become a classic setting and a great example of world building. The heavy of the game is the big daddy. It's an iconic, now an iconic heavy. It's visual reference to old deep sea diving suits sits very well with the underwater, underwater city and clearly builds on a strong foundation of the visual references related to its setted, setting. And it's not relying on game character stereotypes or recycling the more traditional visual tropes. Of course, Irrational had a knack for creating interesting heavy class enemies. With Bioshock Infinite, they had the motorized patriots. The classic chain gun is there, but it helps reinforce the irony of a George Washington statue toting such a weapon. Another game which strives to have coherent visual design to all its elements, and a personal favorite for its consistent art direction and open design gameplay is Dishonored. The world is an incredibly crafted and well-realized artistic vision, and the enemies all feel like they belong in this steampunk dystopian place. The game doesn't have a traditional heavy enemy, but the tall boys, 
within the world satisfy the tougher enemy slot. Their visuals are very much belong to the technology in this English Victorian fantasy, but also their behaviour and gameplay feel very much of the world they exist in. So as you see, you don't always have to rely on the visual tropes in game design. A well-realised world vision and rule set can help. It gives you the framework to create new and interesting elements. It all comes from that crucial pre-production phase. Get that right, and the game has a chance of having a unique, identifiable visual and compelling world. So to break it down, focus on what is important on the high level rule set. Keep the messaging simple and compelling. Look beyond the industry for references. When audience time for investment is limited, build a visual threshold with visual stereotypes so you can then focus more on your unique elements. And lastly, be critical and assess new elements within the context of your world building. Thanks. I'm sure there's some sort of questions. It is a subjective thing. Anyone? Sorry for that. Hello? Um, all right, so questions? Anyone? Um, cool. Um, you talk a lot about visual stereotypes, and um, I was just wondering if there's ever been a conflict in a project where you've worked on where you'd like to sort of strive for a more original thing, but then maybe the producers or whatnot sort of want to take the maybe less risky route and fall back on a stereotype. Um, it has happened in previous projects. The um, usually. What happens is the game designer or level designer, um, game design and level design requires people to discuss other games. I mean, that's, the, that's their subject. So, so they have to use other games as reference and discuss them. The problem is sometimes that when they, they come to me with a new gameplay element is they'll say, you know, they'll give a, a visual example as well and say, I want it like this, like the chain gun toting heavy because he was cool in another game. And the, the thing is with that is that you have to try and talk to them and distill it down to a brief. When I was an architect, you would have a brief which is the client, like the person who wants to live in a house. You, you find out what they want to do and, and, and how their life is and, and, and what the functional requirement is. And with game designers, the best way to collaborate with them is is to act, when they come to you and say, I want it to look like this, is to actually sit them down and, and discuss, actually dig down like you would a client as an architect and find out what is it they're actually needing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if for instance, the heavy, you want them to look unconcerned by, uh, he says, oh, I want them to have bare muscly arms. What he's actually wanting is he wants them to look unconcerned by the player's firepower and arrogant. That might not be that visual. So. Sometimes I've been pressured to create visuals that might be more, um, more cliche, I guess you would say, but, but usually um, games are so collaborative and the discussion is, is usually works so well with, with game designers that, that we can usually end up with something that satisfies both of us. So. Okay. Um, also, another quick question. Does um, NASA know that you're using them as a like visual inspiration for an evil corporation? <laughs> probably not. They probably know now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Any others? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was wondering. I'm not from the art side, so what's the worst thing that a programmer or designer can do to an artist or an art director? Like, what you should never do. Um, what you should never do, uh, probably just say no. <laughs> and the reason why is, I mean, I, I uh, actually, 
The first game I ever worked on was my own. Um, I had a, a, there's a thing out for the PlayStation 1 years ago when I was still teaching in architecture school. I loved games. And uh, there was, they had this PlayStation 1, it was a black version called the Net Yarosi, which is a home dev kit that Sony introduced. And I was passionate about games, so I bought one. And uh, in nine weeks, uh, I learned to program C, and I, I wrote my own game, and uh, did the audio, which was terrible. Well, I don't do audio. Uh, and, and also the graphics and animations and whatnot. And Sony, uh, Sony had this program at the time where they would actually put these games on the cover disc, at the time when CDs were in the front of magazines, on the cover disc of the official PlayStation magazine which at the time had a circulation of over 200,000. So that was the first thing I ever made was a game that, that, you know. So I actually have programmed in the past and I understand that and level design and, and art. I'm not a very good programmer. Programmers would hate me to touch their code. It would, be, it would be a mess. But I like discussion and I like collaboration. That's the best thing about video games is it's such a collaborative process. So. The worst thing I, I hate is somebody that just says no. If a programmer says we can't do that, there's usually something better they can suggest or we can work together and create something interesting. So, um, yeah, probably the worst thing that someone can say to me is no, because I'll probably pester them to get some <laughs> kind of information out of them to make something better. Okay, thanks. Yep, hello. Um, my question is about stereotypes and when you're using them. Um, I find it always uh, exciting when you break those stereotypes, but where do you think, uh, from your experience, the line goes when you have gone too far from the stereotype that the uh, player would um, uh, become repulsed or uh, drawn away from the uh, game? Um. I think it's okay to break, to break the stereotypes quite dramatically. It's whether the player might get to the stage they don't recognise them anymore. I think is, the, is possibly the issue there. Um, when I'm talking about using visual stereotypes, it's usually as a small part of the overall new elements you're creating. Um, you can challenge them, and you can also, uh, for instance, you could put the good guy in a western and a black hat, you know, uh, it creates an interesting, interesting twist on, on stereotypes. So as long as they're still clearly identifiable, but have a twisted function, I think, I think they work. Um, so you can, you can make, turn them into parody or you can, you can use them in a, in a way that challenges the preconception, but they have to still be recognizable. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's a case of it's a case it's a very subjective thing. I think it's it's more of a case of using your your gut instinct there, um, and also things in mobile we can test things as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's okay it's okay to break and challenge stereotypes, but you have to recognise the point where you've taken it to the point that's unrecognisable, and then it's what's the point in having that stereotype in the first place. I think that answers your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, that <laughs> so uh, when you were identifying the heavy stereotype, I was actually thinking that you gave effectively two sets of examples. So you started by more or less identifying the heavy as a character archetype when it comes to its function in gameplay. And then you started talking about its visual identity. And I was going to ask you, like, what do you think from a player experience perspective is more important for the player to be able to recognize and communicate better? Should it be like the, I don't know, the purely mechanical function? Or should it be the aesthetic similarity to like already established, you know, understanding of that stereotype? Because for me, for example, the heavy is exactly like the big guy with the machine gun not so much the big daddy or the bloater, and that's because from a mechanical perspective, it is, I think one is a lot more prolific than the other. Yeah, but I mean, why do, why do you need to have 
why do you need to have that visual convention in your game? I mean, the player's going to experience this harder enemy. Uh, it's, as long as you craft a good introduction and good player education within the game, you don't need to rely on, on those visual conventions. I mean, it's like, um, again, the architect thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's like all churches have a similar function. People come together, sit down, sing, or, you know, whatever they do. And, uh, but they don't all look exactly the same. You know, and it's the same for pickup trucks. They don't all look exactly the same. They have similarities in function, but it's like if, uh, I mean, um, cars from the 1950s, I mean, if, our, if, our, if that was somebody decided that was the way all cars should look like, and here we are in 2015, and we're still driving around in cars with fins on them, you know, it's, they're, they're decorations. And I think it's become, it's become a visual convention but only because we want it to become a convention. It, it's kind of lazy. We can do better as an art director. But then that's my opinion. Fair enough. And if I can ask like an additional question, so what would you say when it comes to any sort of game characters? Would it be uh, like, no, more like game aesthetics, whether it be character or environmental, what would you, what would you say is maybe your favorite visual archetype or stereotype? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I use the heavy because I love games and I like when you get these surprising challenges thrown at you. I mean, I actually like like boss events or mini boss events. It's just generally a lot of them are usually insta kill, frustrating kind of festivals of pain. So <laughs> um, when they're done well, it, it's, it creates a the kind of what they call water cooler moments when you when you go into work and you, you talk to someone about the, the boss, you know, and what what you did with the, in the fight. If it's a good good and compelling piece of storytelling and, and experience, so um, I would say things like the heavy and, and actual those peaks of player experience you get when you face up to a boss is probably the best archetypes. Thanks. So. Final questions? Nope, no one? Oh, okay. Yeah, I was wondering about the stereotypes that, it, do you have like any idea whether, when it's good to use a stereotype or when it's you being lazy? Like, is there any way to know which one you are right now doing? Well, it's good when you're, the visual stereotypes, um, it's, good, it's good when you've got you need to save your, like I said in the talk, it's good when you need to save that exposition time and, and player attention to explain your new elements. So, I mean, you might use the visual convention of a heavy if, say you've got a game where, where it's got far, far more complicated, complicated storyline or controls. Or say if it's a AAA game and you need to spend more time on explaining the world and cinematics and character development. You maybe don't have much time for introduction of enemy types and 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 what the main the main kind of uh, enemy you're fighting in the game is. So they might have to become parodies of you know and, and some kind of simple stereotypes. Um, that's the kind of use case for that. But it's really picking your battles. I mean, you have to decide what's the. At the end of the day, you're making a commercial product. So what is the unique thing that people are going to remember and come back to? And what are they going to tell their friends about? So that's where you should invest. That's where you should fight the fight for your art and design. So decide how much of that your time and attention for the player you're going to spend on. And, and then you maybe actually have to build those foundations of visual stereotype. Um, you need perspective at the start of the project. That's the pre-production thing. Um, not to launch straight into working on on the game mechanics and things. Work out what your pillars are first. Um, I mean, you've always heard, you've probably heard several times about game pillars and deciding what they are, but it's, it's, it's uh, taking those down and focusing them and then saying, right, this is where we're going to fight the fight and spend most of our time and energy on because this is the thing that will make our product great. So um, the other stuff beyond that, then you need to see we need to expedite, say, winter state. We need to expedite the, the uh, time the player gets into the game so we have 
super limited time for the player to understand. It's the East Coast and it's an apocalyptic event. So yeah, we'll knock the Statue of Liberty over and stick some snow on it, done. You know, yeah, that's sure. that one single image. So because we have a game to try and teach the player in mobile, we only have a few minutes. So yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, working at different types of companies? Because you went from two really <laughs> big kind of AAA um, studios to a smaller company. So what do you like about that? Um, yeah, I, smaller companies, well, the product cycle for a start, I'm not facing four or five years of working on a single game. It becomes like a, you're in a war. There's like, a, there's like the first, first um, year or two of kind of joyous celebration and thinking, yeah, we're going to do this. And then you have about a year to 18 months of, of, oh my God, this is never going to end. And then what happens is that you get the, um, you get the press releases or the video, uh, you know, the demo video goes out or something and suddenly the world loves you and you feel much more buoyed by that. And that gets you through the crunch towards the end. But four years is a long time. And you'll hear it from other people. There's so many games you make in your lifespan. So um, I wanted to make more games, and, and that's why I'm at Play Raven for now. Because and also I like challenges. Like I said, I first started by writing that Net Your Aussie game on a PlayStation One. I didn't know how to program. I had to learn that. I don't know how to do mobile games, but I'm learning. I had to learn Unity in the year and get used to all that stuff. And get used to mobile development and metrics. Metrics are crazy. I mean, it's, it's a lot to take into your head, but um, it's new stuff. Always look for new stuff and new challenges. Um, the comparison between AAA and mobile, and the product cycles, but we use Agile more and, and Rockstar at the time when I was there. I didn't know what Agile development was till I moved to Finland. Um, we didn't do it that way. Yeah, it's a it was a team of guys that just gets the job done, really. That sounds really arrogant, but it's, it's the Rockstar team are really good. They just, they, they're doing, they know how to do the product. There's a lot of guys that have been there for a while. And, um, they, they don't have many meetings. I think for GTA 4, I was in two meetings in four years. So that gives you an idea of, we just do the job. Um, so it's a problem in AAA. I actually noticed this in, uh, moving to Remedy and working in Agile development. I think Agile development's really good when it comes to pre-production and developing features. But the problem is that when you move into the production phase, it does a lot of content to push through and you can't really do it in these bite-sized chunks so much. And that's when, that's when I feel that when you develop features in these little bubbles that you can actually, it's really hard to hold the art direction together. Um, so that's why you need the, like I said, you need the, a good convincing style guide and good pre-production. So, yeah, it's um, brute force versus a lot of, cool. a lot of iteration, really. Thanks. Good. Well, thanks for having me here. Okay, everyone, thanks for attending. And just to give you a little bit of a, a heads up, next month we are actually having uh, the pleasure of having Robin Honecka from Phenomena. Uh, maybe you know a little game called Journey. She was one of the lead designers on that one, so make sure to attend. And now feel free to join us for coffee and refreshments in the kitchen area. And uh, did everybody sign the attendance sheet? If no, please come to me and sign it, because we messed up a bit. What do you mean you guys didn't have a single question? <laughs>